I'm always like looking for better ways and more ways to even tap into humans even more, you know, and tap into myself even more. Um, I think the more that a filmmaker or artist really can be more open and more introspective of themselves and knowing like their deepest, darkest corners within themselves, that's just going to help their art so much more. My name is West Givens and welcome back to the Tungsten Originals podcast. You just heard part of my conversation with writer and director Kevin Brooks. We discussed his fellowship at the Sundance Institute, his award-winning filmography, and his dedication to filming projects in his hometown of Memphis, Tennessee. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy. Episode 62 of the Tungsten Originals Podcast. Kevin, welcome to the podcast. Hey, how you doing, man? How you doing? Doing well. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Happy to be here. Happy to be here. Yeah, man. Yeah, this is exciting. Um, yeah. I appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us. I I don't know if I met you directly, but the way I know about you is we both had films in the 2018 Indie Memphis Film Festival, and I was really blown away by your work, and I've kind of kept up with you since then so it's like really i mean that was three years ago now so it's really That's cool crazy, to like right it really is <laughs> it doesn't feel like it it feels like i just went there you know what i mean right exactly yeah which is crazy um so yeah it's cool it's been cool to like watch your career and stuff and you've really achieved some like really incredible things that i'm excited to dive into um but before we get all into all of that i want to like go back to the beginning um, how you got into all of this and like, you know, why you ended up becoming a filmmaker. So I did a lot of research on you and I read some other interviews and uh, I saw that you've been making stuff since you were like six years old, right? Yes. Yeah. It all started when I was six, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's why. So you, I guess you were six in 1993 because that's your Instagram is filming since 93, right? There you go. There you go. Gotcha. The gotcha. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm a, I'm a detective. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> so I read that you watched The Matrix and you yeah. liked it because it was, of course, The Matrix and it was like cool and sci-fi and everything, but it was also like philosophical in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Can you take us back to that and what that meant for you? Yeah, man. Like it was crazy. I remember like it was yesterday putting in the VHS of The Matrix mm -hmm. um, and just like rewatching it and rewatching it and like trying to like uh, in my head like make the scenes up again, um, like especially like the bullet scene where he's like bending right. backwards. Right. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. I did that constantly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's like the action scenes like really captured me, and it was just mm -hmm. like it, it was something I had never seen before in a movie, visually. But at the same time, like I said, like philosophically and just the way that it had so many levels to the storytelling, mm -hmm. like as a as a kid, like, I didn't know what they were trying to say with the red pill or blue. Like, I, I didn't get that, you know? Um, mm, totally. But I just knew something was there. And, like, over the years, I just kept revisiting that movie. And I was like, wow, like, these filmmakers made a film where people can go to the movies, enjoy popcorn, watch this, like, leave, like, overly excited. And, like, wow, I can't wait to see the next one. But at the same time, it's like, if you want to dig deep into that film, there's stuff there to dig deep into. And that mm -hmm. is what I wanted to do with film. I was like, that is what I want to, that's what I want to make. Something where both um, people who like, you know, both types of moviegoers can enjoy a film. Right. It's like a yeah. summer blockbuster, but if you want to sit down and think about it, you can do that as well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I also read that you, you weren't like serious about pursuing it until college, correct? Right. Like it was really on and off because um, like growing up, it was basketball was really like heavy in my life. Um, mm -hmm. My dad had me out there like practicing 24 seven for basketball. I was playing AAU. So that was mm -hmm. kind of like what I was doing a lot. But at the same time, like that back burner, I was always watching movies. I was always intrigued mm -hmm. by movies. And just like when I had time, like reading about movies, like I remember reading a book. Um, it was I think it was like Alfred Hitchcock. I got from the library mm. and I remember like just trying to like watch his movies again, like not diving deep into it, but just realizing like, wow, Alfred Hitchcock is like one of the greats, you know? Um, right. And then like, yeah. <laughs> and then um, it was one moment where I knew I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to pursue like basketball like that heavy. Right. It was mm -hmm. movies to start taking over more that I, I created a movie club in high school 
and we will always like go and just make these like short films we made like music videos that we put on for the whole like school um mm -hmm. and that is when it really sparked and i was like yo i like doing this i, I love like right. sitting there and watching people react to the things that i put on the screen and um that's when like film just kind of like started rising up basketball started slowly like going down and that's when i had to break it to my parents like yo i really want to go into this like film world and you know at first it was like what <laughs> right right like, we put all this time and effort into you um for basketball but i don't know in my heart i was like i'd rather just um you know try to connect with people through vision like visuals and right. you know because um, you can change so much through and like within a movie of what you make and what you put on the screen you can change societies you can change people so that's what really intrigued me so in college mm -hmm. i just went at it like head on did you know early on that you specifically wanted to be a director yes like early on okay. i knew that was it i would say for a little bit there it was like oh maybe i could be in front of the camera but I remember trying out for like theater and like never getting the, 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 uh, it didn't land. Yeah. Right. Exactly. It just didn't land. So I was like, you know what, maybe I should just stay behind the camera. Yeah. 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 So in college, did you take like any kind of film classes in college? You went to university of Memphis, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I took, um, I went through their whole, uh, TV and film production course. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that um, helped out a lot, um, especially like my favorite class was when we got to use like a Bolex camera and I actually got mm -hmm. to shoot on film and um, edit on that. Um, a lot of the kids hated it, but I don't know. It just gave me a lot of respect of um, really being patient and really being very um, methodical about what you film and, mm -hmm. and what you want to put out there. You know, you're not just going to do multiple takes. When you have film, you gotta really right. make sure what you record is what you're gonna use. <laughs> so it taught me a lot. Yeah, totally. I think that's a good practice. Like shooting on film is both a good practice for filmmakers and just like photographers. If you want to get better at either of those, exploring right. film I think is a great way to do that. Yeah. Um, so I, I really want to dive into like your um, like growing up in Memphis because mm -hmm. I grew up just south of Memphis in North Mississippi, just two counties down. My mom's from Memphis. My grandparents lived there so i grew up going there my whole life um and actually the way i got into indie memphis is um was like in the hometowners like shorts um category uh, yeah. like the non-competition category but tate county wasn't listed so i emailed them and i was like hey come on <laughs> like i've been going there my whole life it's technically yeah. it's like on wikipedia it's listed in the metro area and they let me do it but um I love it. I memphis, <laughs> yeah yeah, I, so I finagled my way into that. <laughs> but we were talking the other day about how Memphis has such an interesting culture to it. And I mean, I like, like I said, I uh, grew up just south of Memphis, but I went to college um, in Georgia and now I'm living in New York. And I, I mean, everyone in my family has experienced this. Like you meet people and they have a lot of assumptions about the South and Memphis specifically. And a lot of them are not right. Like my brother and sister went to high school in North Carolina and people used to ask them, like, did we wear shoes where they came from? What? Are you and serious? Yeah. Yeah. Like genuinely, genuine questions. And also, wow. did we only wear overalls? No way, yo. <laughs> yeah. <No. laughs> it's like we do have running water in Mississippi. Right, <laughs> right, right. That's crazy that so, people think that, man. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Like just people genuinely thought that stuff. But, um, Walk me through like what being a Memphian means to you. Cause I know that's something that is really important to you. Yeah, it is, man. Um, and it's funny cause like, you know, so many like filmmakers, people in the entertainment business that come from Memphis, they always contemplate like leaving Memphis. Right. But for me, it's like, you know, that, that day may come, I don't know. But as of right, right. now, it's like, I love this place so much because it, it just has so much character. Like me just mm -hmm. walking downtown and just like people watching, you get stories. And that's been like my yeah. entire life. Like Memphis is just full of like so much culture, so much, so much story, so much like heartbreak, so much love, so much grit. It just has all of these things combined. And you can see it in all these different places that, you know, when I go visit other places, I just don't feel that, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, it's hard to even put into words my love for Memphis. 
Um, and it's just so visually appealing. Like, you can go anywhere and you can find you, like, something that can just stand out on screen that I feel like mm -hmm. so many filmmakers should really just take advantage of, you know? I also think some one of the appeals is that a lot of people don't know about it. You know, like, we've seen yeah. L.A. on film a million times. We've seen New York on film a million times. And, of course, you can't properly experience those places until you're there. But, like there's not a lot of stuff that's like about Memphis, you know? Right. Exactly. So it has this mystery, like two audiences, you know what I mean? Right. And I'm, I was, I was happy that bluff city law tried to like, you know, um, put that more into like, um, a more global audience. I'm glad they attempted that. Mm -hmm. And I really hope like more shows come and do the same thing, you know? Yeah. And they're starting to pick up the, uh, the film industry in Mississippi as well. Like they just opened, um, a, I don't know what the correct term is, I guess like a chapter of the Mississippi Film Office in Natchez, and they're building like a stage there and that kind of stuff. So, I mean, oh, nice. hopefully, yeah, hopefully we're at the start of seeing our respective homes like actually be more on the map for, for that film type right, kind right. of stuff. Um, Did you hear about also uh, Women of the Movement that, that show they're filming? Yeah. Day, I think? Yeah. yeah. Like, and like, <laughs> yeah exactly and like i think yeah. breaking news in yuba county was also filmed there mm -hmm. as well yeah. um so it's it's starting i mean just like everything in the south it takes a long time to get right. where we need to be so right. <laughs> but i think we're getting there also another thing that i really want to pick your brain about is in a lot of these interviews that i read like your work is um you really focus on like the human condition and what that means what it means yeah. to be a person and like what everyday people go through um, and I think when it comes to those human stories, like Memphis really feels like the perfect place for that. Right. Um, so like in your interactions with like family and friends, when you were growing up, when did your, I don't know if obsession is the right word, but obsession with the human condition, like when did that become a part of your art? Oh man. I would kind of say, like, it's always been there. I've always been, like, kind of introspective. Not so much. Right. Even, like, like, I'm not a big talker. I'm not someone who's going to go around mm. and just, like, you know, talk your ear off. But I've always been yeah. very much, I'm going to stay quiet and just perceive and just take notice of things. And I think since, you know, I'm like that and, every, like, been not like that since I was a kid, I've always just notice little, like even if it's like my aunt or like my grandma or my mom and how she would talk to my you know like little things like that I always just picked up small little things like that and that always intrigued me um like body language intrigues me um like non-verbal communication like all that stuff has always very much intrigued me and just knowing like why do people do why like what they do um mm. and like for a moment like um in high school i got really deep into like philosophy um I got deep into like psychology and I still, I read those things like here and there. So mm -hmm. I don't know, just the like people intrigue me a lot. So that's why the human condition mm -hmm. really is something that I really um, love to talk about, something that I love to film. And I love filmmakers mm -hmm. who do that. Like Tarkovsky is one of, like, one of my favorite filmmakers because he's so great at like putting that on camera in a very abstract yeah. way. Like the mirror, that's one of the films like, I haven't seen anything like that in a while, you know? Um, mm. That's like one of my favorites. So yeah, I'm always like looking for better ways and more ways to even tap into humans even more, you know? And tap into myself mm. even more. Um, right. I think the more that a filmmaker or artist really can be more open and more introspective of themselves and knowing like their deepest, darkest corners within themselves, that's just gonna help their art so much more, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So whenever, so like you're, you're, you're going to University of Memphis and you're getting more serious about film, you graduate, what is going through your mind? Like, what's your next step? Like, how, how do I become uh, a person that like my career is filmmaking? Um, that, yeah, it was scary. A lot of anxiety for sure. I remember sitting down freshman year of college with my guidance counselor. And I told her, like, like she was trying to send me more, like, the news route. Like, maybe, like, you should go this way. Oh, do that. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I know there's wrong with that. I have friends that do that and they love it. Right. Um, I just knew I was like, I want to be more in the movie world, more in the commercial world. And she was like, you sure? Like, is, is that really what, you know, like she was trying to like not tear my dreams down, but just kind of give me more of a outlook of like, maybe you can go this route, maybe, you know, but no, I always like wanted to go that, uh, that Hollywood route, but it was full of anxiety because you just don't know. You just, um, you make stuff yeah. and you just hope that maybe the right person can see it. Um, and I remember, it was funny, like I did this GoPro challenge. It was like ju junior year of college, I think, right? And it was like skateboarding. Um, and we won, like me and my friend did it, Hussein, and we won like $500 for it, right? So I don't know what it was. I don't know if I spoke it into existence, but I was like, with this $500, <laughs> we're gonna make a short film and we're gonna get it to South by Southwest. I, didn't, I wasn't even thinking about like Sundance or anything. I said South by Southwest. I don't know why that was like, <laughs> but that was like the goal. Um, so I, I wrote the script up um, and I, I got actors. It was people from the local theater at University of Memphis. And um, it totally went wrong. Like all the actors dropped out last minute. <laughs> It was horrible. <laughs> like that, was like you were at the point of the story where it's either like I get into to South by and my career takes off, or it bombs. <laughs> it was horrible, man. Like it was uh, like one thing after another, and I didn't yeah. know what to do because I spent this five hundred on lens rentals already because because I assumed everybody was going to be down. So um, I had like a breakdown for a minute, but I. <laughs> But my personality is always like, um, you know, things happen and you just got to find a way over it, right? Things happen for a reason. Yeah. My mom always says that. So I just took that, like, looked through um, that situation with that lens. And I was, I told my friend, I was like, yo, um, like, because we used to skateboard all the time. I was like, yo, you're, you're not that great at skateboarding. I said it like that. I didn't mean it like me, like in a mean way. <laughs> right. I said that. And, and he was like, yeah, yeah. I was like. <laughs> is it possible that I can just like um, like follow you this weekend and we just like make something like you know this could be like yeah. an inspirational story somehow something there like you love doing it you do it every day but somehow you're not good at it. like something like that and he was like sure yeah whatever so for three days um, it was like basically um, him and me and I just like followed him everywhere uh, we got scenes. He went skateboarding, and then I was like, "Cool, let's let's get you doing a voiceover." You know, like you know, just say your thoughts. What do you think of skateboarding? What do you think of life? Like my friend is like he's super in tune with life, and I love it. You know, mm -hmm. um, so I was like, yeah, just like just talk about how does skateboarding relate to this, that, third. So like a month later, we finished the film, um, but I think we missed the South by Southwest deadline. I think that was it. I didn't like look at it right or something. Like something didn't come, you know, again, things are going wrong. But right. I remember being in class and I should have been paying attention to the teacher. I wasn't, um, I was on my phone and I saw that Sundance was having this Ignite uh, program where like you submit a short film. So I was like, cool, um, maybe, like, maybe we can do this. So I submitted the film. We finished it, I put music to it. Um, and like a month later, they were like, yeah, you've been selected. And that's when I was like, holy shit. What well, can I curse? I'm sorry. Holy crap. You can, you can. <laughs> that's no, that's crazy. a holy shit moment. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, it was, it was. Yeah, that was a crazy moment, man. Like uh, I almost cried in there. I think I did oh. cry, I'm not gonna lie. I, I did I cry. Would, yeah. So yeah, like that was wow. junior going to senior year. And like ever since that, things just kind of like trickled here and there with like different opportunities. But that was, that was amazing. That's really what kicked it off. Um, super grateful for that. Like, um, yeah, that was crazy. Um, and like still thinking about it, I get chills. Man, so the to, to, to explain to the audience what the Sundance Ignite Fellowship was, um, from what I read, it was like, uh, you know, a program to find the, the most promising filmmakers from like, what was it, 16 to 24 age range, something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And only five were selected in the entire world? Yeah. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 man, if 
if I was you, I would tell every person I know that I did that. <laughs> Again, that's me being not a talker. So it's like, no, I'm not going to. Oh, no, absolutely. <laughs> No, I, <laughs> yeah, but that's just like a, what an amazing accomplishment. And I love that it's something that you just kind of like saw in class and was like, well, I guess I'll submit to that. So right. you, you get into that and you're still in college. It's also blows my mind. Um, and, and so like, does the trajectory just like skyrocket from there? Like what, what happens in the fellowship? Like, you know, take us, I'm probably gonna sound like your grandmother. Tell me all about it. You know, <laughs> how was it? <laughs> Um, I'm so no, proud of you. <laughs> it, it started out um, kind of rocky, like kind of like, uh, I wouldn't say horrible, but I had never been on a plane before. Let's say that. So me going to Utah, first time on a plane was like a horrible experience. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so that was like, okay, let's see how this goes. But once I got there, it was beautiful. I got to meet really cool um, people that were already in the industry. Um, mm -hmm. And just to hear them talk and to hear them speak about, the perils they still go through even when they've made it you know like people think oh you make it totally cool it's solid but no they were still talking about how it's hard to get funding how it's hard to get stuff made um and a little bit that's like depressing but at the same time that's just like motivates you more to be like i have to be on it i have to give it my all and that's really what happened during like i think it was like a week and a half trip of me being like, yo, when I get back, I have to be on it. I have to dedicate mm. everything I have, all my energy to this. And I'm just that type of person. Like anything I do, I'm trying to dedicate 110% to it, you know? Um, so when I got back, I was like, I have to, like, what's next? What can I do? And luckily that right. was like, um, like Memphis started doing the Memphis Film Prize. So I was like, cool, let's do that. Let's like keep, let's keep perfecting this craft. Cause I knew I like, I don't know, maybe some people would get into the Sundance thing and think, oh, I've made it. I, I, I'm really good at my stuff. But me, I was like, no, these other folks, I feel like they're so, they're, they're like, they're really into something. They went to NYU. They went to like, the, like LA already, like those film schools. So I was like, cool, they're great. How do I get on their level? Like, what are they watching? What are they doing? And I think once I got back, that's when my filmography of what I watched and the filmmakers that I studied really just took off. Wow. So I'm glad you brought up the Memphis Film Prize because that's a perfect transition. Um, also to explain to the audience, so the Memphis Film Prize um, is like a film competition based out of Memphis where the uh, selected film wins $10,000. And uh, like Louisiana has a version like this. Um, I think probably other other cities have like similar types of competitions. Um, but you won the Memphis Film Prize for your short last day. So can you tell us about that short and how it was to submit to the competition? Oh man, it was it was very uh, it was great. I love that competition a lot. And doing last day and winning with that was a really awesome experience because that was a story, again, it was something that I, it was just about perceiving and just like listening to this lady talk about how, um, do people know, uh, let me tell them what the story's about basically. Um, yeah, go for it, yeah. It's um, a father's last day with his daughter before he finds out if he's either convicted or not convicted to go to jail for a long period of time. So we followed them as um, he's with his daughter, as he's with his wife. And like the audience doesn't know that this is what's going to happen, but they get like this tone of like, mm. something's not right. Why is he, you know, treating, like, why is he talking to his daughter this way or his, or, or his wife? Um, and then at the end we find out that he's going to court and he's been, he's been prosecuted. Right. Um, and that kind of just sparked from me listening to a lady talk about how her um, father was like wrongly, wrongly convicted and sent to prison mm. and just hearing that just made me think of like yo i wonder what like not knowing that that was your like father's last day like what if she didn't know that what if he spent his day with her mm. and they did all these things and um she just didn't know so i think i wanted to make a film from that perspective of like what you mm. know what was that day like you know kind of like uh 25th hour like i love that movie by spike lee with edward norton you know so yeah. So do you often take, cause I'm, we're in a second, we're also going to talk about bonfire, which I, I got to watch and was really blown away by. And I like how it blended like the documentary and, you know, narrative uh, aspects of it. Um, do you often get your ideas from your like uh, real life interactions with people? 
and then expand upon those? Yes, I try to, for sure. Um, I think it's just more mm -hmm. genuine that way. So, yeah, I, I think for a moment there, I would try to force stories, but now it's more, just right. like I said, just listening, perceiving, and just seeing what's around, seeing what people say in little words here and there, and then just start piecing together um, the story bit by bit. So whenever you win, did you, um, like, how did you how early after the sundance fellowship did you submit like did you make and submit last day was it like immediately your next project no like that's funny um i didn't win the film prize until it's i think it was the third year yeah third year that okay. the film prize happened because the first year that it happened i did a film called marcus i submitted that mm -hmm. and then i remember i vividly remember this i was back in l.a because Sundance was having the next fest. They invited they invited us out for that. And I remember constantly checking my phone thinking, oh, like, did we win? Did we, you know, it came down to the wire and we didn't win. And I was like, so sad. Um, but at the same time, it's like, no, just stay. Like, it, it just motivates you for next year, right? So then I did another film, Grace, um, with Rosalind Ross. She's amazing. Um, came down, but we didn't get it, right? Um, mm -hmm but not giving up. And then the next year was when I did last day and I won on the third time, third, third, third time's a charm. And then I won again the year after that. So I was like, cool. It, it was worth waiting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then after so that, you, you oh, win at the, <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Just like, the story for everybody. Right. I feel like last year before COVID, everyone was like, I'm about to have this great year. And then everything changed, of course. So you, you win the film prize for the first time. And then does that give you a sense of confidence of like, okay, I can, um, now I have this money to like make the next thing. And now this is just further proving my like skill to myself. Like how did, how did that change your perspective? I would say that, yeah, it gave, it gave me a little more confidence, but at the same time, I knew it was a long way to go. Because this is a long journey, you know, filmmaking right. is a long, long journey. So I had confidence, and I was like, cool, that validates me a little bit more, just to keep going, like to keep studying. Right. Um, but I knew, like I said, I knew it was a long way to go. But from there, I was like, cool, what's next? What, what else can we do? You know? I think it's cool because it seems that, like, winning or losing, you're still going to have that. You're still going to have that idea of like, got to keep going, you know? Yeah, I think you have to. You have to have that drive. You, you can't be attached to the outcome. You know, you have to just live within what you love doing. And I got that from my friend. Like, you know, if he was attached to the outcome, he wouldn't be skateboarding to this day. But, you know, he, <laughs> mm -hmm. but he just loves going out there, being on the board. And that's the same with filmmaking. I just love putting visuals up. Yeah. I'm not attached to the outcome. Mm -hmm. I like the phrase not attached to the outcome because I think... A lot of people, when they think about their goals, they think about like an award. Like, of course, we would both love to get an Oscar. Right. I will not turn down an Oscar. Sure. But <laughs> if we base our whole idea of success off of getting an Oscar and then we never get one, that's like, okay, well, it's never successful. Like, well, there's plenty of amazing films that have not gotten that level of like recognition. And um, I think attaching your success to the outcome um, can invalidate the piece of art that you just made, which like should be like, that's the thing, right? you know, like that's why we're all doing it is, is to make that thing and connect with people. Exactly. And so yeah. I love that so much. I also wonder if any of that drive comes from where you're from, because there are people that grow up in LA that like their family has been working in the industry forever or same as New York, you know? Yeah. And, um, I'm not going to say that they haven't had like, you know, this uh, imaginary person hasn't had their own hardships and stuff, but like there's not, no one's coming flocking to Memphis right now to like find the next big filmmaker. So I feel like there's a little bit more of an uphill climb to like prove yourself and, you know, just both of us being from that part of the country, you know? No. Yeah, for sure. I love that though, in a way, you know, I don't want it to be easy, but yes, we all want to make it to the top of that mountain. But I don't want it to be easy. I want I want to have a story at the end of it, and like like oh, I just told you about the whole like you know people dropping out at the last minute. I love those stories. That that's um that's great. So I want to like at the end of this, 
we were both like 60 or whatever, you know, we do this again. We both have stories. To tell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. We'll be on like episode 5,000 of the podcast. <laughs> and we'll come back on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so I want to talk about bonfire because that was, um, the short of yours that I did get to watch and I was really, I'll, I'll put the link, um, in the description, uh, of this episode to bonfire. So when you're done, uh, listening or watching this episode, you should absolutely go watch it. Um, cause I, I really loved it, but, um, it did this really interesting thing of, like I said earlier, blending this documentary style, like talking head footage, but also this narrative where there's like actors and it blends all of that. So, um, could you first like explain the idea behind bonfire and what it's about and then talk about why you chose to go about that story with the merging of these two genres. For sure. Um, it's really funny talking about bonfire now, probably not in the moment, but it just sparked from a really bad, um, like a uh, breakup, like a relationship that just went mm. bad. And, uh, I was really down in the dumps for a while, to be quite honest. Um, I just didn't know what to do. I couldn't like think of anything but the relationship and how it went wrong, right? So that was on my mind 24-7. Mm -hmm. My friends got tired of me talking about it. So I was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, you can only sit and watch 500 Days of Summer so much. So I was like, <laughs> so I, was like I have to um, do something. So I told my friends like, yo, let's, let's just, um, well, at first before that, it started with me just asking my friends, like, what is love to you? And now they would just answer like, yo, mm -hmm. give me this and that and that. And mm -hmm. then it sparked from, cause I was in this weird state, just asking random people, like just be at a coffee shop and like, yo, what is love? Mm -hmm. Right. Without a camera, just like really just wanted to pick people's brains. And then from there, I was like, you know, let's just. Let's just make a film. Let's just like film what I'm going through, but just add a story within it. So it was sort of a script, but it was so loose, right? Mm. Um, it was very much influenced by like some Terrence Malick, like Knights of Cups or, um, oh, it was another one. I can't even think of it, but it was very like inspired by like uh, Terrence Malick. So mm -hmm. I just rented like a camera for like so many weeks, like, it was horrible. I don't know. I spent too much money off of this breakup, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, we just like went and filmed a whole lot on VHS on 4k on like those mini like Ronin cameras. We went to the fair, mm -hmm. um, and I had a great actress. Her name's Jasmine who played my girlfriend in the, uh, in the film. And I don't know, it just, like, even our, like, um, friendship, just, like, it felt very realistic on camera. Like, we have so many scenes that didn't even make it into it because it would have just been too long of a film. But as that narrative was taking place, I was like, yo, what if I just still go around and ask people, like, what is love? What if I get these candid interviews and, like, put them in there? Um, and that's where that sparked. And I was just, I wanted to, like, make this, like, weird morph of, um, like narrative, but also documentary style and just like put it together. Cause I think that just makes it feel more authentic of what are people's thoughts about love? What are people's thoughts about heartbreak? What helps them get through heartbreak, you know? Um, and mm -hmm. listening to these people talk on camera was getting me through it at the same time. So it was like, it was mm -hmm. great. And I knew that, okay, if it's helping me, I know it will probably help somebody else who watches this, you know? Yeah, I I always love talking to um, filmmakers that have used like um, grief in their life to make uh, to inspire a short or something because I've done that a lot. Um, you know, we've had a lot of like um, I've had a lot of family members pass, and that has like definitely inspired like a lot of short films because it's such. You know, you were talking earlier that you have to look inward you know to to tell these stories and i think that's like one of the most intimate ways you can do it and as much as it is um like you're kind of opening your heart up to the world mm -hmm. um as scary as that is i found that audiences really connect with it because so many people are going through it right you know what i mean yeah exactly and there was a specific quote in bonfire from one of your um from one of, one of the people that you interviewed and they said heartbreak is the human condition. Um, and I really like that because 
whenever you're in those pits, it can feel like you're the only one experiencing it. Um, and you're like alone in that scenario. But, um, I'm so glad that you did the, the combination documentary, um, and then like fiction narrative because it is a real story as much as like, you know, you had actors and like, like the scene in the car, like that is quote unquote fake because you like staged it. But like, those are real conversations that have been had all the time. Right. Exactly. I, I, I really, really enjoyed bonfire. So, uh, again, if you're listening to this, the link will be in the description. I highly recommend you go check it out. Um, cause I'm a big fan. Uh, I also want to jump to your work on the Memphis and Shelby County film and TV commission. Um, which, I was also blown away by that you were, I don't know if it was one of the youngest or the youngest member of that board at the age of 22. Yeah, <laughs> that was crazy. Um, and it came unexpected, but uh, it opened a lot of, again, it opened a lot of doors and I got to meet like Lynn Stittler and she's super amazing. Um, and just seeing like yeah. how she works and just like picking her brain. Um, and just especially when like she was like, in the middle of getting Bluff City Law to come here, which was, like, huge mm. for her. And it was, like, I think, like, right. a year before I even came. And just seeing, like, what she had to do for that, how she had to constantly take trips to Nashville, how she had to constantly have all these uh, different meetings to get that to happen. And then talk about um, the money situations and things of that sort. And they're still trying to figure that out and get better incentives. I think that's, like, the key that, mm-hmm. like, what Memphis really needs. Um, but, yeah, it's, right. like... Being part of that and being in that environment, again, just gives me another dynamic to filmmaking. Because, like, I love the creative side, but also seeing the business side of things is super important, you know? Yeah, yeah, because it is a business, and so you need to know how to how to raise those funds. So can you, can you explain what the Film and TV Commission is and, like, as a board member, what your role was? Yeah, with the Film and TV, um, Film and TV Commission, basically, we meet maybe, like, uh, like once or twice every like two or three months or so. And we um, basically come and we look at reports of things that were filmed in Memphis and see like how they did, um, what money, like where, where did the money go? How much money we have to spend for projects to come here. Um, we speak on like different incentives. And I really love how they have an open room where people can just come. Like it's not just us board members in there. Mm-hmm. People can just come and just ask questions and pose questions. And um, through that, that helps us determine, okay, what can we do to help with Memphis and like get more things here and what do filmmakers need? Like even with COVID, I remember they um, created this system where like they would like give out money to like certain filmmakers who were in need, who were like, cause it was no jobs for a while, you know? So right, yeah. yeah. So them doing that um, is super powerful. And me, I'm just, I wouldn't even say I have a big role in it. I'm just someone who, like, again, I'm there. Um, when we had to vote on things, I talk to the other board members and we vote on, like, new board members to come in. We vote on who's the head of it, what we need to get passed, and things of that sort. But I'm by no means, like, a huge, like, oh, I'm calling shit around. <laughs> well, calling shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not yeah, yet, exactly. <laughs> You're like, I got Bluff City right, Law. Right, right. It was me. It was me, man. <laughs> That's what a what a cool thing. It's so exciting to hear like city officials, quote unquote, recognizing the power that film can bring to small communities. Because I mean, that's why Atlanta is what it is, is because they realize like well, also the state legislators, but like they realize like, oh, if we offer these incentives, like it can really benefit the local economy. And now Atlanta is I have I know so many like actually Jada Cardoza the last episode of the podcast she's editing at marvel right now in atlanta like no so many way. people i know are working at marvel yeah I love yeah it. she's an assistant editor at marvel and um shout out to the sound editor of this podcast clea cullen she is uh also working on marvel as like a set dressing pa oh my gosh so, yo in atlanta as well right yeah, so <laughs> Shout out to them. <laughs> but it's it's really exciting to hear. Um, so I posted on the Tungsten Originals uh, Instagram story. Um, if you're not following us, you absolutely should. Posted a picture of you and said, like, we're interviewing Kevin. You know, um, what questions would you like to ask? And we had um, a question that I would really love to run by you. So 
Um, Nicole, friend of the show and actually director of Lighthouse Keeping, which is a short, um, which is a tungsten original, she uh, wanted to get some tips from you on getting into some bigger festivals. Um, you know, we we take like distribution classes and film school and that kind of stuff, but uh, those big festivals, it's it kind of seems like this faraway place that like only the big dogs get into. So, with your experience at Sundance, what have you learned about distributing? your shorts through festivals? I would say like, that's such a tough question. Cause it's like, even you can have like one of the best films in this, they still don't pick it up. You know, it's really weird. Yeah. How yeah. Festivals work. Um, I know for like what they were talking about when I went to visit, they were just saying like to avoid the later deadlines, like you don't want to be like, you know, they have the late deadlines and then no, it's like, no, you, even if it's like a rough cut, like if you're dealing with a feature, even if it's a rough cut, like send it in like the early deadline so they can watch it and tell them that it's a rough cut, tell them what you still working on. And that just helps them like keep you in, like if they love the film, they're going to be like, yeah, just, you know, finish it, but at least you're right. in there, um, in the back of their mind, you know, and also, um, right. not become, fr- like, I, I don't like kiss up not kiss ups but you know how some people like uh try too hard to like overly impress but they were just talking about like get to know who the film festival organizers are the people who are going to be watching the film maybe you can even email right. them like, you know say who you are um say what you do say where you're from and actually like tell the story of where the film came from like a lot so many people mm-hmm. that were saying just submit the film and that's it all right but right. to connect, right. you want to tell them, like, where did the idea come from? Like, um, what inspires you daily? What, what made you want to make, you know, things like that. So they can put a face to the film. So those are just some of the tips they gave us. But still, it's, it's still a hard world to even navigate getting into that, you know? Yeah, because even if you have a great drama, like, maybe it's just too long. Or, like, maybe they had a similar drama the year before. So, like, even though it's it's amazing they like may not want to accept it because it like they have this all this other programming to think about so yeah it's definitely a a layered question but i I think the idea of just like making that doing that cold email is really smart because i've also i've gotten discount codes to festivals like that just like hey i'm a southern filmmaker i filmed this entirely in mississippi uh just wanted to see what that would get me and they're like oh yeah here's 10 percent off or something so yeah even in that like more tangible like financial aspects like that can right. that can totally help and you were right about the time like with short films don't go too long they always say that you know don't make like a 30 minute short because it's not going to block it you know yeah exactly if it's 30 minutes it better be like the best short <laughs> in the world <laughs> <laughs> so good oh so here's some advice just make the best short in the world and then your life will be there much easier <laughs> <laughs> and that's the episode right, right. <laughs> i again I, I read a lot of interviews um with you in doing research for this and you know you talked a lot about how hollywood is changing in the type of stories that you know that it's telling and the type of stories that like audiences are getting used to. You specifically talked about Moonlight being the first feature to win best picture with an all black cast. I'm really hopeful that Minari, um, which is uh, an A24 film that I haven't seen it yet. I'm going to, but it looks amazing. (laughs) Um, It looks so good. I really want to see it, but um, I'm hoping Minari gets some like recognition as well um, because the Oscars were like right around the corner. So, you know, that interview where you were talking about things changing, that was from a couple of years ago. In this time, do you think we are still moving in the positive direction or do you think we've faced some setbacks? I, honestly, I think we're moving in a positive direction. I think there's still some setbacks here and there, but that's going to happen. I mean, that's any type of climate we're going to be in. It's always going to be those little small uh, pitfalls. But for the most part, I, I really do think we're moving in a positive direction. Like even seeing like, parasite when you know uh movie right like right things like yeah that, exactly i'm like yeah. yes i love where this is going and i haven't seen minari but like you said like i hope that gets attention as well so i really love the the way that um things are changing and like what's getting made and the tv shows and the series the amazon prime is putting out netflix you know hulu like it's like everyone yeah. is starting to catch on to there can be diverse voices you know like not everybody wants be the same right. thing you know everyone has their different styles of what they want to like um intake so i really love the climate that we're um, in right mm-hmm. now i think that is 
a good way to loop into my next question. Um, you had uh, a really fantastic quote in this interview that you did with Choose901. And um, I want to read it right now and pick your brain about it because I think it perfectly encapsulates like who you are as a filmmaker. And it also reminds me a lot of like what we're trying to do with Tungsten. So you said, the way that I see it, we're all in this cave and we're all just trying to make it out. All of us artists, we're trying to see the light at the end of the tunnel. So if you make it out of that tunnel, which I have not done yet, and you see the light, then the key is to make a manual and head it, hand it off to your friends so they can come out also. I love the idea of, I mean, it reminds me of, um, oh man, the uh, Andy Dufresne is the character name Morgan Freeman in Shawshank yeah. Redemption, <laughs> where he's climbing through the, <laughs> wow, I'm a terrible filmmaker, we're forgetting that, that title, <laughs> where he's like climbing through the tunnel and everything yeah. trying to get out. Um, can you expand on that a little bit? Because I think that is the absolute perfect um, attitude to have. Uh, I mean, I feel like you hear so many stories and there's so many egos out there to where yeah. People get to a certain place in life, a certain, um, you know, they get a certain accolade and they just tend to forget. They, they're, right. saying, they, they're like, cool, I made it. Forget it. I made it out. They put the dirt into the tunnel and no one else can get out. And they're like, cool. As long as I made right. it, I'm great. But I feel like that's just not the way to do it. And that's not the, like, j like even if it's not film, like, no matter what you do, this is not the way you, humans should treat each right. other, right? We should be able to like, okay, yeah. we made it out. Here's the tools. Here's what I, here's what helped me. And now I can help you. Now I can't go back into the tunnel, <laughs> but I can give you all the tools. I can be there, like whatever you need to help you come out as well, you know? So I feel like that, mm -hmm. I feel like that's just key to like, just life. Like we just have to be able to do that. We have to be able to yeah. make it out and then look back to the next man or woman and say, okay, Here's my hand. Let's go. Let's keep put like, let's keep. And I also think, you know, we were talking earlier about advice on like, you know, reaching out to festivals and stuff. I think this also loops into the advice of just like, just reach out to a filmmaker and ask him like, Hey, can I set up like a five minute zoom call and just like ask you some questions? Like I found this New York based, uh, production company, found one of the producers, messaged them on LinkedIn. And I was just like, Hey, I would just love to pick your brain. And they, and they immediately responded a few minutes later and was, and was like, yeah, here's my email. And it's like, wow. Like, those are busy people, but right. when you don't come at them from the point of like, I want connections out of you or networking out of you or a job opportunity, like I want knowledge, yeah. then I think people are way more open to, to talk about those oh, things. Yeah. So, um, and we live in a world of social media. I, I really, really, really like that. We should all be taking chances. You know, like, yeah, it's a different world we live in now. So we should all be taking chances and just reaching out. Like it can't hurt, but like, you can get a no, but what does it know? Like, what does that mean? Nothing. Just keep, you know, somebody's going to say yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so, uh, you know, you are 27 now. Oh my You've gosh. You've had play that. quite the don't career. That. Yo, oh, my right. back hurts and like, <laughs> oh my gosh, man, you don't understand. <laughs> I know. I saw your, your Instagram post where it was like, I'm 20, I've been 27 for three days and I've been watching CNBC it's all crazy, day. <laughs> The light, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, you've, you've come yeah. a long way since 1993 mm -hmm. when you saw The Matrix and started recreating some of those scenes. What, if you could tell yourself one piece of advice, like that person who was sitting in that class on their phone, not paying attention and just started, like decided to apply to that Sundance thing on a whim. If you could tell yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? I would say... And I have this tatted actually. Enjoy the journey, man. Cause it's gonna be a journey. Like like this life, relationships, um, film, everything, it's gonna be a journey and you gotta enjoy the ups and the downs, man. You just can't you can't be complacent. You just have mm -hmm. to take every day as it comes and just keep moving forward. Enjoy it. Yeah. Cause I think to this day, you know, we I feel like we both feel like this sometimes. It's kinda like, oh man, I'm not where I wanna be just yet. So it's like you get down a little bit think of those totally. things but if you just enjoy the journey and you just know like yeah just keep going and at the end of this journey you know you, you'll have a story to tell at the end of the day whether this happened or it didn't happen but you have a story to tell right i, I i've thought a lot recently about um the idea of like remember when 
remember the fact that you are now where you wish you were a year ago or something, you know, because like we, at least I should I speak for myself. I'm constantly like looking forward, like what's the next thing? What's the next thing? Like yeah. with tungsten a lot, like, you know, we're working on a lot of projects, like where can we, how can we be doing what better with this? Like, what are these new ideas that we can, um, that we can do that it feels that I, I'm still not achieving things. But then I have to remember like a year ago, I kept on thinking to myself, man, I just want to be in New York working on tungsten and stuff. And it's like, oh, well, here I am in New York working on tungsten and stuff. So right. like, I think it's good to have those check-ins with yourself of like, oh, I've actually, I've actually come a long way. Right. So I totally agree with yeah, that. Of course. No. Looking ahead, what do you see as like your future? Not necessarily like your five-year plan or whatever, but like what, um, you know, I know you're about to go on a shoot right now, actually. Um, so what projects are you working on and where do you, where do you hope to end up in the near future? Um, I really want to go into the commercial world for one thing. Um, I want to get into that. I really love the idea of telling a story within like 30, 30 to 45 seconds, you know, um, that really intrigues me right. cause I really like just sharpens your um, tool set just for telling stories when it comes to longer things like movies. Um, but that's like my ultimate goal is to do a feature film. Um, I would love to do it this year. I'm not going to mm -hmm. jinx it because I said that last year and we know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm just going to, again, take every day as it comes. Um, that's what COVID taught me. Um, but um, yeah, I would love to do a feature film. Um, and I have a couple scripts written and I have something that's kind of in the vein of like bonfire, but not about love, but it kind of deals with that mixing things together. Um, different, um, mm -hmm. like narrative documentary and just mixing different video formats, um, and posing a question, but it wouldn't be about love though. Um, and yeah, I, I I'm doing this like docu series with, um, it's like Kellogg's and, um, Nike for black girls run. Um, in a couple of weeks and doing stuff like that, like traveling, get to travel like different places and just, um, again, hear people's stories. Um, that's, that's really just what I want to do. That's my next like five year plan. But like I said, I really want to do a feature. I've been wanting mm -hmm. to do one since I was a kid. So if I can knock that out and it could be, you know, something that people really connect to, that would be great. Absolutely. So I, I'm really glad, I mean, you know, for those who don't know, we tried to record this two nights ago and we had as many technical difficulties as anyone in the world can have. So we had to reschedule for now. But this is actually, uh, I think, a cool time to do this because in in a couple of minutes, you're about to have to head to this to the shoot for this music video that you're working on. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about the music video? Yeah, um, the music video basically is for this artist, Taliba Safiya. And she's kind of like in the vein of, I don't know if your listeners listen to like Ari Lennox or like a Erica Badu, right? And um, it's fi we're filming that within like a church. And it's very, again, I'm really inspired by like, a, like Terrence Malick a lot by like Tarkovsky, um, Paul Thomas Anderson. But uh, with this, it's like very like wide angle mm. lenses. And we just wanna kind of give the idea of, cause like, her song is about being balanced. Her song is about being um, 10 toes down to the ground, like not, being too airy, not being too like uh, worried about what's going on around, but being really centered. So um, with this uh, story, we really just wanted to make something that feels very like, have you, I don't know, have you seen Healing Creek? I did a video for her. A while. Okay, I'll see you so. to that. But I did video a video um, with her like a while back when she was on tour. This was before COVID. Um, and we shot that in New York and we shot that in Philadelphia. So mm -hmm. um, she's very about that centeredness. And we did that in nature, but this one we want to do more within like um, a different element. Like we're not really going back to nature. We're doing this in church and mm -hmm. it's like a torn down church, but it's beautiful. It's like, again, with Memphis having this mm -hmm. texture. So it's like a torn down church, but it's just beautiful how, cause it got burned down a long time ago. So you can still see the streaks like within the walls, but it looks great on camera. Um, and I'm just really excited like for us to do this and people to see what this film, I mean, not film, but this music video um, looks like and they can connect with people because her last song, Healing Creek, connected with people. And that song was about healing and people needed to hear that. Um, so, yeah, she just she's such a great artist. Mm -hmm. So whenever you're um, in the final hours, like before you go to a shoot, what's going through your head? Kind of like what I just said, just trying to stay centered, like not trying to be um, too everywhere. 
just be more in my head right now and just focus on cool what what am i trying to get across to the audience it's not about me it's about serving the artist and it's about mm. serving the audience if i can do those two things i've done my job well i think that is a perfect <laughs> note to end on thank you again for you know taking the time to sit down and talk with us um i think people are going to really love uh what you had to say and like you said i'd love to sit down when we're both 60 or maybe sooner right. maybe maybe a couple years from now before we're right. 60 <laughs> and uh you know see see how far you've come because i mean you know you, you you've achieved so many great things and but more importantly told so many great stories and um connected with a lot of people that i am only looking forward to um your future and you know when it comes to that future if you ever need any help, I'd love to PA whatever you need. I'll be there. I want to be Definitely. a part of it. Um, so, Same you know, here, I just, I, I think I'd love to work with you in some capacity. Yeah. So thank you. Man. Yeah. It'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. So thanks again, everyone for listening. The next episode will come out a week from today. Be sure to check out Tungsten Originals on all of our social medias. Um, and also if you're listening to this, you can check out the YouTube video on our YouTube channel where you can see, um, some behind the scenes footage of, uh, Kevin's work and some other footage and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, be sure to check out all that stuff. And Kevin, thank you again. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you, man. You have a good one.